Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Connect. If you're new here, my name is Alex and I am the Connections resident here. I love to get people connected to different things, whether that be like a community group or serving, or if you just want to grab coffee and talk, like that's what I'm here for. And so if you want to meet up, I'd love to meet you after the service. But uh, a little bit about me too. I go to Denver Seminary and studying here, um, pastoral care and counseling and really lean into that. And I'm trying to soak up all the different opportunities to learn more about what God is doing both in the church and in his word. So I'm always thankful to get opportunities like this to kind of practice that too. So thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Um, if we uh, haven't also met, you probably don't know this about me, but I'm a huge Taylor Swift fan. And when she came to Denver, I was super excited. You see, the thing is, I really love like experiences like that, but I've never had the chance to go to one of those big concert things. So when Taylor announced the tour and was coming to Denver, I was like, I have to jump all in. See, I, though, am not really good about jumping all in because I get a little nervous. Sometimes I'm not sure if I want to commit all the way. I never know, like, maybe I need a backup plan or what about the caveats that might happen? And so it can be a little challenging for me. But the time came for us to buy tickets. My friend Mac and I were going to plan this whole thing out. We are like, we're going to go all in. We're going to get these tickets. So you probably heard in the news the whole Ticketmaster debacle and stuff like that. Well, we signed up for the pre-sale, got verified and everything. And so the morning, I think it was like a Thursday, we got all set up. And it was a miracle. When we logged in, we were like 136th in line, which is not everyone's story. Some people didn't even get into the queue. It was crazy. But as the numbers kept going down, 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 down to one, we finally got in the queue, this panic set over because I'm like, wait a second, do I even have the money for this? I am like trying to go through school. I don't have the money to spend a thousand dollars on tickets. Also like how many tickets do I want to buy? What if I want friends to come with me? Or do I even know if I'm going to be free on the dates of the tour? Like what if I have a wedding or a funeral comes up? Like I don't want to miss all these things kind of set over me. And I was like, I don't know what to do. I'm kind of afraid to go all in because these tickets are not cheap. And so the time came, the queue dropped, and we got in, and everything was a blur. You just like had to click, 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 and we bought four seats, one for my sister. My friend Mac got a seat for her friend, and then boom, it was all done. And I was like, that was insane. I'll tell you what, though, I'm really glad I went all in, because someone who just appreciates, I really love music and love how things are written, tempos, lyrics, all kinds of stuff, and it was a privilege to get to go to that concert, and it was a lot of fun. But the thing is, if I didn't go all in on buying those tickets, even with all the panic that set in in that moment, I would have missed out. It takes full commitment to go there. And I'll be honest, it's really hard to go all in, challenging sometimes, even if it's for something that you really love or someone you really love. But the thing is, going all in, taking risks, even when you don't know what the future looks like or what it's going to do to you or how you're going to figure out how to make it happen, it's worth it when it's for Jesus. Because I'll tell you, going all in with Jesus, there's no one that loves you more than he does, and there's no one who has the authority to back it up than he does. Going all in with Jesus is worth it. You see, though, the call to follow Jesus isn't a call for just some people, a small number of us, a portion, or maybe just, you know, a few of us in this room, but it's actually for all of us. The call to follow Jesus is for all of us to go all in together. So this morning, we're going to take a deep dive into Luke 15. Uh, Luke 15 is going to show us a really cool glimpse of how we get to work together to go all in with Jesus. Last week, uh, Chris preached on going all in with praying first. And by doing that, when we, when we start with prayer and going all in with that, not only are we setting a good foundation for ourselves in our relationship with God, but also um, we also open up the door for God to work and God to move. But this morning, we're going to look at how we can love the one far from God and how we can welcome them into the fold to God's family through celebrating. And Luke 15 gives the best picture there ever is about that. So if you need a Bible at all, you can grab one in the back, or if you want to open up your Bible app, take some notes. You can also download our free church app. Just search Connect Church Community in your app store. You can get that, and you can take some notes as we go along. There's so much good here. And I know Luke 15 is probably a passage that you've heard before. Um, It's been around a long time and a lot of preachers and people have used it and it's a good one but I encourage you this morning to listen to it with fresh ears look at it with fresh eyes because there's so much here there are so many layers that we can continue to unpack I think Jesus has some stuff to say to us about it so before we dive into that let's pray together and ask God to help us see how we can join in his heart and welcoming people far from him God, thank you for your word and that we get to talk about it and we get to hear what you're saying. Would you allow us to embrace the heart that you're showing us in Luke 15? 
would you help us to see who around us is lost and needs um, to come home to you, that you would embolden us to go reach out to them. And may this text um, really empower us to go do that. Thank you for who you are and for your son who makes all this possible. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So Luke 15 opens with some context for us that's actually super important. So we're going to hang out there in a second. Um, Luke gives us this context starting in verse 1. He says, Now the tax collectors were all ga- and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, okay, the Pharisees are upset. So here's the context. This is really important for actually the whole rest of the chapter. The Pharisees are upset, and it seems they've been watching Jesus for a while. If you actually look over in Luke 14, this tracks, Jesus was just at a table with sinners, and he's eating with them, and the Pharisees, again, are not happy. And so they have all this in their, in their mind. They're constantly watching Jesus, like, are you going to make a legal faux pas? Are you going to break a law? We're going to come after you as soon as you do that. Like, they're just intently watching him to see what moves he makes. Also judging the fact that he's eating with these sinners, because in that society, that's considered not okay. It's, it's unclean. And so they have a lot of opinions about this. So pay attention, because this is actually really important for why Jesus is going to tell us stories that he does. Jesus shares the stories to show us, one, that he's highlighting a defense of his ministry and why it's okay to eat with sinners. And two, he's inviting the Pharisees to embrace the heart that he has. He wants to uh, encourage them to embrace God's attitude and posture toward the lowly and the outcast. So these stories are super important. Based on this context, we're going to see a whole lot unfold. So the question for the Pharisees was also the same question that I think we get to encounter as we read this text. Are you willing to replicate Jesus' behavior that he's about to show? Will you follow him in this way? Jesus begins his response to the Pharisees in verse 3. This is what he says. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now, we're pretty far removed from the world of shepherding. Perhaps maybe when you're trying to wrangle your kids together, it feels like herding sheep. Or maybe when you're stuck in traffic, you feel like the sheep being herded. But the thing is, we're pretty far removed from it. And the reality of shepherding in Israel is a challenge. You've got pasture land for sure, but then you have hills and rocky crevices and valleys and boulders and all kinds of stuff. It's, it's not the easiest thing. And you also have predators that would love a sheep snack. But you've got to really keep those sheep together. You've got to make sure they're always staying together and on the right track. They, they're in the pasture land. But if sometimes a sheep does wander off because sheeps, when they're, sheep, when they're like eating the grass, you're focused on that and then suddenly you look up and everything's gone, right? So sheeps are actually super social, which is interesting. They love being together. And so when they do get lost and they look up and they see none of their sheep friends around them, they get very agitated and panic. And so they suddenly lose all sense of their surroundings. They might keep wandering further and further and away. And then they sometimes, you know, lose track of their path and they might not even know that there's a predator around. And so what happens is this, the sheep becomes really helpless. So it's actually pretty important that you go find the sheep. The clock is ticking. In Jesus' story, this owner has a hundred sheep. And that's actually doing pretty well back in those days. If you have a hundred sheep, you probably can afford to have some additional shepherd hands with you and they can help take care of the sheep. So the shepherd is going to go off and find the sheep, leaving the 99 in the care of his hands. And he's looking everywhere, probably goes miles, looking in the ravines. He's looking in the rocks everywhere, trying to find the sheep, listening for maybe the bleat of the sheep. And when they finally, when he finally finds the sheep, he's got to toss it on his shoulder because this sheep is so agitated, it can't even make a decision. So the shepherd literally has to pick it up and carry it home. Now, I don't know about you, but if I spent all this work trying to go find a sheep, when I got home, I would throw the sheep in the pen and then like go find some food or like take a nap because it sounds like a lot of work to me to carry a sheep miles and miles over the hills all the way back. But the shepherd doesn't do that in this story, does he? The shepherd calls all of his neighbors and the people in town to throw a party 
for the sheep because it has come home. So Jesus asks this, this uh, he actually does a really th- funny thing through this that we don't capture in English. What's so striking to us when we read this is like, yeah, of course, you know, throw a party, great. But what he's doing in this whole passage is he's asking a question. In the Greek, the whole story is one long question. But in English, we just can't capture it. And so what he's kind of trying to do is nudge the Pharisees and go, like, if you brought a sheep home that was lost, you'd probably throw a party. And he's trying to get them to beg the question and answer, yes, of course, we'd celebrate. Like, it's exciting because you didn't know what was going to happen to the sheep. It was lost, but now it's found. And so he wants to beg the question and point it out to them that in the divine economy, celebration is part of what happens when you cover the lost. Now, is Jesus trying to be Captain Obvious? No, I don't think so. Like, of course we celebrate, but he is the most brilliant teacher around. And so I think what he's trying to point out is what we see in verse 7 when it says, I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Like I said, Jesus is pointing out that when someone returns, we celebrate. That's what God does. When heaven uh, parties, it means someone has come home. So now hold on to this thought because it's going to keep building. Jesus still has a couple more stories to share. Listen for how this keeps going. Uh, Let's read picking up in verse 8. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So what do you notice about this story that's a little different than the last one? For one, the lost item is not a sheep, it's a coin. But we also notice that instead of 99 sheep and one sheep missing, there's 10 coins and one coin missing. We see there's kind of this shifting, the, the groups are getting smaller. Pay attention to that. In Jesus' time, the lost coin would have been a big deal because this coin represents about 10 days' wages. So if you have 10 coins, that's kind of a lot of work that you've put in to get that earning. So losing one is a big deal. This woman is likely managing the household finances, and these coins probably represent their family savings that they've put together. As a student, I work a lot of part-time jobs, like I, I do dog sitting, I do tutoring, I work here at Connect, and so there's all kinds of little things. Each one pays for something different, like tutoring helps me pay for rent, utilities, dog sitting, kind of the gas and groceries, and then Connect helps me pay for school. All kinds of little things. And if any one of those went missing or a little awry, it would be kind of tough. Like if I did a dog sitting job and someone paid me cash and I lost that summer between getting it and the house, I would freak out because that might mean fewer groceries, one less gas tank, it would be kind of frustrating. I would be searching all over for that missing cash, right? And maybe the same for you. If you lost a paycheck, somehow you actually still had a physical check, or if your routing number or something went awry, you would track that down because that paycheck means a lot for you. And the same is true for that woman. As he's telling the story, there's supposed to be the sense of urgency. Um, She's sweeping the whole house. She's looking in pots and pans. She's looking under the bed. She's looking everywhere trying to find this coin because it means everything for the family. So when she finally finds it, she calls everyone together. What does she do? Again, Jesus has phrased this whole story like a question. He wants us to say, we're going to party. We're going to rejoice. The recovery of what was lost requires celebration. So hold on to that thought. Because again, we're going to see it. Jesus is trying to build this up. Of course we celebrate. Of course we celebrate when the lost come home. Now, Jesus has one more story to tell. This one's a little longer, and again, probably the story you maybe have heard the most. However, my encouragement again is to listen to this with fresh ears and see what Jesus is doing. He's responding to these Pharisees, trying to invite them in. They've been critical of him for trying to take in the lost. But what Jesus is going to do is shut down their criticism by revealing the Father's heart. So, Jesus is on a roll, so let's let him have it, and let's walk with him here in verse 11. Jesus says, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. 
So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the paws that the pigs were eating, but not one person gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been starving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with, a pros- with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you were always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Now this story grabs my heart every time I read it. Even a thousand times reading it, it still it just punches me in the gut. I think it's one of the best descriptions we have of the heart of God and what it looks like when we come back to him. Notice the escalation. We started this, the three stories with one out of 99. Then we have one out of 10. And now Jesus shows one out of two. Just one son missing. But how how big of a loss that would be to miss just one son out of the two you have. You see, this whole story is a big deal to Jesus. The son essentially tells his dad, I want your money, but I don't want you. So give me it. Let's just move on. And of course, this is painful for the father because all his wealth is probably wrapped up in assets like the servants and the sheep and the land. So he's got to liquidate it, which takes time. So even more painful. And then the son runs away and spends all this money using it to the last drop. And then he gets desperate. He hires uh, hires himself out to feed the pigs, which would make the audience grasp, the the Jewish audience, they they could not have imagined working to feed pigs. And so this is a pretty low low. And also in Jesus' day, it's a pretty agrarian society. So helping people isn't really something you do because the food that you you make and you grow, you sell it in the market and use it to feed your family with very little left over. Even the rich really wouldn't have had this idea of helping people out, the poor. And so humanitarian aid is really more of a modern idea. And so um, even this Greek thinker named Plotus, he thought that helping the poor and the destitute was considered prolonging their misery. So when this son is at the rock bottom and he's looking at the pig's food and saying, I want to eat that and no one else is giving him food, like he is very near the edge of death. But then he gets a small glimmer of hope that maybe his father has some favor. And so he decides to go back home. This is a big deal. But what's so cool is that the son comes back with this initiative, but that's not how he's greeted because the father runs out to him. A commentary I read put this so well when it says, the son's initiative is quickly superseded by the proactivity of his father. I mean, I can't imagine a better line to describe what God does. He comes after us. Soon this father is giving instructions to throw like the biggest party this town has ever seen, like cue up the best music, put the best stuff on the grill, get this robe out, all the things. You see, the father understands that when the lost are recovered, celebration is required. But someone isn't on board, and that would be the son, which also kind of sounds a lot like the Pharisees, doesn't it? Someone's not on board here. In fact, the son gets so mad that he actually demands the father. He said, I have essentially been a slave to you. The son decides that he isn't a son anymore when he has this conversation, that he's been just this laborious servant of the father's and he considers the father to be unfair. But what the father reminds him and invites him into is to actually have compassion and say, no, look, your 
brother has come home. And so because of that, we must celebrate. Do you remember the Pharisees' original complaint? What did they say about Jesus? They said, he eats with sinners and tax collectors, the lowly and the outcasts. But what did the father in the story do? He actually embraced them in. Someone who was running to him, he embraced them in. They threw a feast together. And so, friends, I need to ask you something, like a, a very real question. Are you replicating Jesus' behavior? Because what we see in these stories is that when people who want to come home come home, then we celebrate and we party. Or sometimes maybe you think you look like the Pharisees and you look at people who come with their baggage and being outcasts and you look at them with judgment and disgust. If we want to live all in with Jesus, the latter is not an option because Jesus doesn't do that. When we look at him, that's just not how he lives. It's not part of his character. It's not how he lived. It's not how he taught and it's not why he died. And so we can't be a part of that either. But why, why do we often fall so short of that? And why is it so hard sometimes to celebrate for people when they come home or when they have any you know, interest in Jesus and changing things? I think sometimes we maybe forget our own story that perhaps we've been part of this for so long that we have put on this air of an appearance or we've checked off all the boxes and we follow all the rules. There was a time when we made that first step, but we've maybe moved down the road a little bit from there. I'll admit that sometimes I forget the attitude of celebration, um, partly because I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up in a church and my dad was the pastor, and so I got to see lots of baptisms and, and things, and that was pretty normal. And I got to see him at Bible camp. I got to see him at church. I got to see him even during college. And so sometimes I watch them with the lens of, oh, you know, just another one. That's cool. The routine. Or I've also seen so many people get baptized because I've grown up at church and then watch them walk away later. And so sometimes I get down. I'm like, oh, is that genuine? I guess we'll just have to hold on and see. But the thing is, that's not how God looks at people who come back. He's not giving them tests for if they're genuine or not. He's not saying, oh, we've got another one. I guess we've already thrown too many parties. We should be done. No, that's not at all what we see. What the Pharisees failed to see was that sinners and outcasts that Jesus was eating with were exhibiting the kind of relationship that God wants with us. You see, they were doing the, the best thing. They were actually pursuing discipleship. I want you to pay attention and look at verse 1 again, where it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. What two things did the sinners and tax collectors do? They gathered around him and they listened to him. I mean, if that's not the posture of discipleship, I don't know what is. They were coming to Jesus with an active heart ready to hear from him. The Pharisees, not so much. My friends, can we remember what this looks like? Like gathering around Jesus to embrace him and to listen to him? That is what we're trying to do. and It's what we must keep doing. We can't lose sight of it. Now, if we're trying to be all in on Jesus, gathering around him and listening to him, we must pay attention to what he's saying in these stories and actually do them. We must help um, in this cause because God celebrates when the lost come home. So let's think about what does this look like in South Denver 2023. I think one thing that we could do really well is to practice welcoming people home. We don't necessarily think of this super often, but... Maybe you have a new family that's moved into your neighborhood and showing them unmerited favor and grace and love might be something that they're not expecting. And so when they're nervous about this new neighborhood or maybe they move for a new job and you welcome them, that's going to make a big impact. You can set aside the judgment about what cars in the driveway, what they look like and all those things, but and just embrace them for who they are and show them that. Practice that welcome. Maybe you're a regular at the gym and you go at the same time every single day and so you notice who's there, who's not, who's regular. So when you notice a new person, welcome them in. Make them feel like they're at home. Maybe offer to spot them or something like that. Practice welcome there. It even comes home to church here. When someone gets baptized, practice welcome in inviting them out to lunch. Take them, celebrate, invite them into your home. When someone joins the family, we want to make them feel welcome. So... Practice welcome this week. I think number two is uh, sit at the feet of Jesus in your chair time. 
take some time to just be in the Gospels. I think Chris kind of mentioned how he was reading through the Gospels um, and doing like two chapters a, a day, and I think you can get through it in like a month and a half, something like that. Um, spend some time starting that, like continuing it. Because when we see, sit at the feet of Jesus, we're practicing that posture of discipleship that we see the sinners and the tax collectors do in Luke 15. They're coming to sit with him and listen. So do that. Show it to your kids. Show it to your community group and your friends. Show them what a posture of listening to Jesus looks like and engage with his words this week. Number three is kind of the hardest one. It's the one that I think is sometimes the scariest, the one that we don't really want to do. But number three is to go out and find the lost. There's a lot of lost people in South Denver. There's a lot of people who are far from God. And it's hard. It requires a lot of work to go out and find the lost people. And I think that's why it's the one we shy away from the most. We like the idea of Jesus' third story because the son kind of makes the decision to go find uh, the father. But I know it doesn't say this explicitly in the text, but if you think about it, this, son, this father is pretty wealthy, has a lot of means. I bet there wasn't a day where he wasn't sending out messengers to go find his son. However, we do have some explicit um, examples in the first two stories of a search being done, where the shepherd goes into the hill country or where the woman is sweeping her whole house. And so search is part of the deal. We've got to go out. We can't just stay here and hope people come. We have to go out. So maybe your community group is so good and it's your favorite place to be, but perhaps there are maybe some other non-Christian circles you can also find. Maybe there's some other places you can engage. Or perhaps it's not always hanging out with the moms from the homeschool group, but maybe going hanging out with the moms at the library, the public library and story time. Or maybe it's, I don't know, not just playing softball at church, but maybe doing a rec thing at the rec center where you can play sports with people who aren't necessarily like you. I don't know what it looks like, and it does take some creativity, but the Lord has blessed you with circles of influence and skills and gifts that can put you in some really neat places where you can build relationships with people. So spend some time praying about that this week, where God has placed you in your circle of influence and the routines and habits you have about how you can go out and find the lost and be intentional about it. Each of you has that opportunity, and you never know what God might do if you're willing to position yourself in a new space. I want to leave you with this. If you can celebrate finding a lost sheep, if you can throw a party for finding a lost coin, you can throw the biggest party the city's ever seen for a missing child coming home, then how much more should we celebrate when someone chooses to run into the arms of God? You see, Connect, if we say we are of Jesus, then we have to embrace God's gracious heart fully as our own. We can't just do part of it. We can't just do a little bit here and there or when we feel like it. If we want to have the heart of Jesus, it has to be part of the way that we live. So I want to leave you with this. Connect, if you want to be all in with Jesus, Join with God in loving the one far from him and rejoice with God in the everyone coming home. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for this example that we see um, of how your heart in action um, welcomes people who are lost and welcomes them home as, as your own. Would you empower us this week with your Holy Spirit to go do that, um, to welcome people who have been far from you, to be on the lookout? Give us boldness to um, go out and find the lost. And God, may we celebrate so hard. May we celebrate with all the excitement, with all the joy when they do come home. It's in your sons and we pray. Amen.